We are in Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> we'll actually look at verses 9 through 20. But to get the full context, let me go ahead and start from verse 1 and I'll read the whole chapter. This is the word of the Lord. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, and the sound which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among the men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name." Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying, out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and a blood, rather blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word today in our time together. Let's pray. Father, well, like many evangelicals, I see most of Revelation as that which takes place in the future. In it we see a worldwide tribulation afflicting the land, the sea, and even space, causing the death of hundreds of millions. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 24 and other places. In verse 21 and 22, he shows you the gravity where he says, There will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. This sort of magnitude is unbelievable. And to continue to see that the world's wickedness increases. They will even set up a false Messiah and an image of Him in worship, killing those who will not. Christ will judge the world for its wickedness, yet at the same time, what's so sweet about this time of tribulation is He will draw His elect into the kingdom like never before. Here in chapter 14, we'll see the 144,000 with the Lamb, 
And then it talks about calling out the destruction of Babylon. And in particular, uh, we'll also see verses 9 through 20, where we're dealing with two topics today. The first of them is the doom of those who follow the Antichrist. And not only those who follow the Antichrist, but really all people who reject Christ as their Savior. Secondly, we'll see the harvesting of the world. Now, the first part, we call this text, I've titled this, The Grapes of Wrath. You may have known that from the book you had to study back in high school, John Stein, Steinbeck's novel. It's, but uh, the book, actually, the title is not based upon Revelation 14. The book's title is based upon Julia uh, Ward Howe's song. Uh, she and her husband met with Lincoln in 1861, and uh, she wrote a song relating it to the Union Army, but in particular to Jesus Christ in Revelation 14 and 19. You've heard it before. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, it says this, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Uh, that's Revelation 14. That's Revelation 19, grapes of wrath. And ultimately what we're going to see is that God's wrath is poured out on not only the people on the earth, but ultimately in a place called hell. And I don't say this with delight, uh, but I say this simply because this is where the text is leading us today. I have to follow the text. Sadly, many evangelicals, when you talk about hell, they go, do we need to talk about that? I, I, I hate that. I don't like talking about it. Well, the problem is, for you, is this, the Bible talks a whole lot about it. I like what Dr. Johnson had to say about it. He says, when we talk about hell, we're talking about a biblical subject. For if one were to say, he is a hellfire and damnation preacher, as if to suggest that is something very bad, he has not really read the Bible very much, or at least if he's read it, he has not paid sufficient attention to it. You see, hell is set forth in Scripture, and it's set forth to warn us, to give us admonition, which we need, that we are looking at things that affect our eternal destiny. So we are talking about a very, very solemn and significant subject. Wrath and judgment are part of the gospel. They are part of the message of God, and we are not preaching the true gospel unless we preach it in the form of which it is given to us in the Word of God. I think he is on the money. The first part of this section we'll see is the doom of those who follow the Antichrist, as well as all those who reject Christ in this life. Verse 9 and 10 of Revelation 14. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, we'll see first off in verse 9, it says, If anyone worships the beast... Uh, also known as the, in particular, Antichrist of end times. Um, what exactly is this? Well, the Antichrist is someone who sets himself up. Uh, we'll see, if you look in Revelation, as God. He declares himself to be God. And the whole world will worship him. The whole world except believers who already have their Messiah. We see in chapter 13 that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast on his hand or forehead. We're not sure exactly what this is. And I would caution before you know exactly what it is. Because the Bible doesn't say uh, there's something to do with the number 666. And what we do know this is that it definitely connotes worship, I believe, as well as ownership. That the Antichrist, the beast owns you uh, and you worship him. The reason why I can say this is we see in the 144,000, they have the name of God and of Christ on their forehead. So it's a picture that this one's been stamped, this one's mine, and this is the one I worship. Um, as you know, we could probably look at technology and we'll see that in several places in the United States and in Europe you have actually uh, computer chips that you can put into a person's hand. 
I just read this this past week. I'm aware of many uh, instances of this, but one in particular just was on the news. You may have seen it this past week. It says, man gets live chip implant at mobile fair in Barcelona this last Monday. Uh, in reading the article, it says, he can make a payment at the bank with it. He can open the door to his house. The man says, it's super for me. It's very useful. The chip is the size of a grain of sand or two. And it's covered in a material that's biocompatible so the body doesn't degrade it over time. He can withdraw the chip easily. Simply make a little cut in his hand and press it and it comes right out. Wow, that's scary. Uh, is that the mark of the beast? No, we just don't know. Like I said, I think we need to be wise as serpents but not be too quick to, uh, to say that's what it is. But I can tell you something. I'm not getting anything in my body uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, notice what happens, though, that those who worship the beast, it says they will drink of the wine of the wrath of God mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. When it says full strength, wine in ancient days, it was normally mixed with water or spices to give it some flavor. Uh, but here God says, Drink it. We're not adding anything to this. You're going to drink it straight. What's in the cup? The wrath of God. And for the first time, we'll see in Revelation the eternal home, not just of the followers of the beast, but of all unbelievers. And I would say this one thing is caution. When we go through this, please know this is not a way to, to uh, scare individuals into believing the gospel as if the fear of hell will drive them to Christ no, the fear of hell can certainly help, but ultimately love of Christ brought out by the Spirit in our lives by, by uh, giving us new life causes us to come to Christ. However, we're also not going to back down from the text either. Uh, the Bible says many things about hell, and we'll just go through these quickly. First off, what is the character of hell? The character of a place reveals what happens in it. When people say Lone Star State, you think of Texas, but Lone Star, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's like it's by itself. It's independent. By the way, I hope you celebrated Texas Independence Day yesterday. If not, I question your loyalty to our fair state. Um, there's also a place called Cowtown. You think of Fort Worth. Um, that's what would characterize the city. Not fully, but there's a lot of cattle there. But in hell, what's the character? It's torment. It's a place of torment. What are the means of torment according to this verse? Well, it's fire and brimstone. Uh, brimstone is nothing more than burning sulfur. Burns the eyes. Um, it smells terrible. Uh, we see in Genesis 19 the destruction of Sodom. And what is it? Fire and brimstone. And so it was a foretaste of things to come. Uh, notice it, who is in the presence of. This is interesting. It's in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. And you may have said, well, I thought hell was for demons and unbelievers, and it is. But note here, it says, in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. How does that square? And by the way, how does that square with other parts of Scripture, right? 1 Thessalonians 1.9, it says, These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So one verse it says it's in the presence of uh, the Lamb and the holy angels. And another verse it says it's away from the presence. How is that work? Well, it's difficult. Uh, you'd have to say, though, God is omnipresent. We always uh, believe that. Uh, he is uh, omnipresent. He is all things at all times at all places. So it seems there is a presence of God even in hell. But note this. When it says in the Psalms... Lord, let your face shine upon us. The face presence of God is, is this picture of he's showing us his mercy, his kindness, his goodness. So people of hell will never have the face presence of God, if you will. They never experience his mercy, his kindness, his goodness. They will only experience his wrath, right? Maybe that's what it is. It's difficult. Verse 11 and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Reading an article the other day, uh, some of the Brits are upset with Princess Diana's brother 
because he's not taken very good uh, care of her graveside. And so the article reads about Princess Diana's final resting place being restored after 20 years. Can you believe it's been 20 years? But think about this as a believer for a moment. I'm not comfortable with the term final resting place, nor should you be. That phrase in and of itself is not true spiritually or physically, is it? Spiritually, a person, when they die, they go to heaven or hell. The Bible makes this very clear, or really a place called Hades, which seems to be a holding place until the lake of fire. Uh, but the Bible makes this clear. After, you know, in, after this life comes the judgment in Hebrews 9.27. There's no second chances. And so it's not true spiritually. It's also not true physically. Although physically that is her temporary dwelling place, uh, but it's a resting place. But it's not, it's not eternally. I don't think so. The Bible makes it clear he will raise the dead. Believers, we will enjoy uh, glorified bodies in the heavens, new heavens and new earth, whereas unbelievers will perish eternally. Um, let's note this also, though. It says in verse 11, there will be no rest. That doesn't mean simply they will never sleep again, but it's this, this concept that there will be no rest from pain, no rest from punishment. There's no, there's no respite. There's no break time. Uh, there's no rest from their own sin. Think about this for a moment as a believer. As an unbeliever, uh, they will never be repentant, ever. Repentance is a gift from God, it says in 2 Timothy 2. Uh, so they will be, what does it talk about hell? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping connotes this concept of physical, emotional pain. What's gnashing? Well, Acts 7, you will see that the people are, uh, basically they gnash their teeth at Stephen and they're going to kill him. They're so angry with him. That's what you do to this day if you get really angry with somebody, your teeth kind of gnash together. It's natural. It happens. So the people that are residing in hell for eternity, well, who are they angry with? Well, they're angry at God, right? I imagine they're angry at God. They're angry with God's saints. And some people say, well, maybe they're angry at themselves because, you know, they, they wish they had have repented. The, just the concept of repentance, of feeling bad, does not ever cross their minds. They may have a sense of remorse, but repentance never, never. They hate God. They've chosen not to follow Him in their whole life, and so they're choosing to for eternity. And God has made that choice for them as well. So, there's no rest. How, what is the duration of it? The duration is forever. And at this point, some people pull up stakes and say, wait a second. Infinite punishment for finite sins here on the earth? I'm not comfortable with that. John Stott, who I have a lot of respect for, um, I think he's wrong on this point, but he would hold to something called annihilationism. Uh, what, he, what he wrote is he says, emotionally, I find the concept of the eternality of hell intolerable. And I do not understand how people can live with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. So we held to something called annihilationism, which is a concept that says basically the final state of unbelievers eventually is extinction. That perhaps they go to hell for a particular time, but then after that God makes them extinct, just snuffs them out. Um, Stott is a believer. He's in heaven. I have no doubt about it. But he doesn't, uh, let's put it like this. It's not really the orthodox view of hell, although there are some believers that hold to it. Um, Tommy Nelson at Denton Bible Church puts it like this, and I think this is a good way to describe it. There's something in us that wants that to be true, annihilationism, because none of us who hear the doctrine of eternal punishment do not recoil. And the reason that we recoil in horror is because we do not understand the glory of God and the nature of sin. We just don't get it. And something we should note this is that although we may sin against God in a finite sense because we're here on the earth and we... Uh, people of hell are punished for eternally for sins on earth. But note this, we sin against the infinite when we do this. Only against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil, the psalmist can say. So to put it like this, Dr. Allman at Dallas Seminary was very helpful in this. He, he would talk about this, that, you know, if you go over to somebody's house, and I happen to be in your house, and uh, this fly is 
flying around and I just kind of swat at it and it dies. You know, I nailed him right off the bat. You would say, thank you, right? I just killed that fly. Thank you very much. Um, maybe you brought out your hamster, your son's hamster later on, and I, I'm petting it and I accidentally drop him to the floor, <laughs> wounding him. He walks away kind of at a limp. You would say, that may have been done on accident, but I don't think we're going to let him hold our hamster anymore, ever. Suppose you introduce me to your dog, and I said, oh, I hate these kind of dogs, and I kick him hard. At this point, you say, you need to leave my house, right? Because that's a much bigger deal. Don't do that kind of stuff. And as I go outside your house, I see your little son by the front door, and I say, what a cute little boy, and I reach over and I smack him right in the face as hard as I can. At this point, I'm going down, right? And I should be. You see, the way it works is like this. As the nobility of the creation increases, so does the punishment for afflicting that creation, right? It gathers steam every time. Of course, as it should. This is the way Christians think. This is the way we should think although some in the world do not. Many in the world these days say a fly has just as much nobility as a human life. It's crazy. Think about it like this, though. Now, not only are you afflicting creation as a sinner, but what are you doing? You're seeking to afflict the creator of the universe because the psalmist can say, against you, you only have I sinned against. So yes, yes, your sins have gone against the infinite, and yes, you will pay for it for eternity. Hard teaching, I realize this, and I don't say this with glee. It's difficult. It's difficult teaching, but it is the teaching of Scripture. Romans 4.3, what does the Scripture have to say? I love what Romans 4.3, that is literally what the phrase is. What does the Scripture say? Let's go back to, what, what it, does Jesus' words give clarity to the horror and eternality of hell? Well, Luke 16.24 is talking about the rich man and Lazarus. You know the story. Lazarus goes to uh, Abraham's bosom. Uh, the rich man goes to Hades. And there he cries out, saying to Abraham, Have mercy on me and send Lazarus, so he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. What would provide him any sort of sense of relief? A drop of water on his tongue. Matthew 25, 46, the eternality of hell. Jesus says, these go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. To ask you, why eternal? Why eternal? Well, the Bible's pretty clear on this. They can't pay for their sins, right? No payment is ever enough, it says in Psalm 49, enough to satisfy God's wrath, to propitiate God's wrath. The only payment for sin is Christ, and they have rejected that. You see, the issue is sin. We do not yet realize what great sinners we are. I was on the way back from Oklahoma City a couple of weeks ago and on the plane, and I don't know the way you are, but I've felt convicted in the past. I'm sitting on a plane, and I'll never see this person again, and I probably should take opportunity to give the gospel. And so uh, there's many times I have, many times I haven't. A lot of it is just because I chickened out. Uh, but this couple of weeks ago, I just felt really burdened. I was praying about this. Lord, please give me the boldness. I'm going to be clear with the gospel and pray that you save whoever I'm next to. So sitting there, the guy sits right next to me. And uh, I, I looked over and I said, are you on your way to Dallas on vacation or on uh, going back home? And he said, I'm going back home. I said, great, me too. So we talked. He told me where he was living and where he worked and... Um, and I said, well, you know, uh, I know the area somewhere, somewhat. Do you go to church anywhere around there? And he said, yeah, I go to this church. And, and the church that he described is, is a quote-unquote uh, gay church in Dallas. And I say quote-unquote because we wouldn't, wouldn't call that a true believing church. But uh, I said, you know, um, I think it's fascinating to talk about churches. I mean, what... I think one of the best things a church can do is not only help people in this life, but prepare them for the next. Let, let me ask you something. What does your church teach about how a person is right with God? Because God is perfect, and, and we are not. <laughs> so what would you say to that? And he said, oh, that's 
That's a good question. Um, I think we would probably say we just do the best we can. Just do the best we can. I said, well, uh, okay. Would you mind if I share with you what our church believes? Because our church really takes us straight out of the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about what makes a person right with God? And he said, sure. So then I went through the gospel saying that, you know, the Bible makes it clear that we were made for God's glory. Isaiah 43, we were made for his praise. Problem with us, uh, we'll call him Matt. Uh, Problem with us, Matt, is uh, we don't honor him. Instead, we sin. Uh, Anything we think, say, or do that's displeasing to God, that doesn't glorify him, um, it's sin. Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I got to tell you that the the news gets worse because Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. If you said, hey, Jeff, why don't you come over to my house and you can wash and wax my car and I wash and wax your car and then afterwards I knock on the door and you open the door and you reach out your hand and shake my hand and say, thanks so much. I would say, that's that's not right. You give me wages, right? He goes, yeah, of course. I said, well, the wages of sin is death. God gives us what we deserve in hell eternally. I said, but you know, God in his grace loves us so much. Romans 5.8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. I said, you're familiar with Christmas, right? Jesus was born, right? At that, uh, that's why we celebrate Christmas. He came to the earth, perfect God-man, raised like any other person, but he wasn't like any other person. He's perfect. Later on, uh, he would be crucified on a cross and raised from the dead three days later. That's why we celebrate Easter. Um, But that's not what a Christian is. A Christian is one who's come to the place of trusting in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace, you're saved through faith. Um, I said, so it's not your works. It's not anything you do. Christ pays for your sin. He gives you his righteousness. You give him your sin because you have to deal with sin. And one day Christ is going to come back. He's going to make all things new. He's going to judge the world. I said, have you heard of that before? That's the gospel. And he said, no, I've never heard that before, which is a shame on us, right? uh, He doesn't know the gospel. He's probably in his 50s. And I said, you know, your view and mine are different. I'm getting this from the Bible. Uh, Does that concern you? No? Well, let me ask you this. Are you a good person? He said, um, yeah, I'm decent. I said, can I test you on that? All of a sudden, the argument changed like that. No, no, you can't. You cannot test me on that. I said, okay, well, do you mind if I test me on it? And so what I want to do is I'm going to show him the law, right? Because only through the law do people have a, just a grasp of their own sinfulness. So I said, well, and I went through just three of the laws and said, you know, the Bible says you shall not lie. I said, I know I've lied many times. What would you call someone who lies? And he's quick to go, liar. I said, yeah, okay, uh, that's right. I said, if I know I've taken things before that didn't belong to me, and it would make me a thief. The Bible says also you shall not murder. I said, I haven't murdered anybody. But Jesus says if you uh, hate your brother in your heart, you've murdered him. So by my very own words, I'm a lying, thieving murderer at heart, and I am not ready to meet God unless God has sent someone who can stand in my place. So I told him, Matt, if I were to die right now and stand before God and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven? I would say, you shouldn't, except for there's a man seated at your right hand, Jesus Christ, the God-man, and he died for me. Long and short of it, to make a long story a little shorter, Matt did not believe. But Matt's problem was his sin. You don't want to deal with sin. Man doesn't want to be paid for his sin and he doesn't want to talk about his sin. As far as he's concerned, he's not even a sinner. But the Bible makes it very clear that's the eternality of sin. People are paying for sin. They can never pay for it. And they reject the only payment for sin, Jesus Christ. Verse 12 and 13. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds Follow with them. Here is the perseverance of the saints. And we know that God is the one who perseveres us. But I love what uh, Dan Duncan said here. That's what characterizes the believer. Obedience and reliance on the Savior. 
We can only be obedient by relying on the Savior. And the incentive is that the suffering of the saints is only temporary. Even the Puritans would say something to this effect. The only hell that believers will ever experience are here on the earth. It's not even hell. That's how, no, no matter how bad it gets on this earth for you, this is only how bad as ever it will get for eternity. You see, all saints in verse 12 and 13 are blessed to die. Now, we know blessed, death is a curse. We know that. But for a saint, Psalm 116, verse 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You see, unlike the unbeliever, y'all, we rest from our labors. And compare that to hell, uh, who have no rest. We have rest. We have rest from our pain, our suffering. And get this, maybe the most important thing, we have rest from our sin, right? Whew. We have rest from our sin. We don't have to deal with our sin anymore. We, don't, we will not be sinners in heaven. Even though we are saints now and sinners, that will be changed in heaven. We will no longer be sinning. How awesome is that? Not have to deal with the flesh anymore. Not have to deal with y'all's flesh anymore, right? <laughs> I digress. Their deeds, it says, their deeds will follow them. Their deeds will follow them. Isn't this what Jesus says in Matthew? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves don't break in and steal, right? For your tre where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. I love Galatians 6, 9. that says, let us not lose heart in doing good for in due time we will reap if we don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Because your good deeds follow you. It's, I like the way old J. Vernon McGee said it. He says, our works, good or bad, are like tin cans tied to a dog's tail. We cannot get away from them. They will follow us to the bema seat of Christ. It's a good word picture. So, enough about that. Let's go into the second part, and that is the harvesting of the world. Harvest time is when you gather up the crops together. And what we're about to see in the next few verses, it's either, it's one of two, and I'll be honest, I'm not certain what they are. Because different theologians that I highly respect teach them. What we're going to see here are either two pictures of unbelievers that are being harvested. One of them, it seems to be grain. The other is grapes. The second uh, Option is this could be, in fact, the harvesting of believers that we'll first see, and then the harvesting of unbelievers. And both of those are viable options for interpreting the text. But either way, both of these, whatever view you hold to, ultimately it's not going to happen until Revelation 19. So these are uh, snapshots of the future, if you will. Verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. All right, whenever you see someone like a son of man, you know that's Christ. Daniel 7, 13, He steps up to the Ancient of Days, and what does he receive? He receives a kingdom from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. We see him also in Revelation 1, 13, and he's walking among the lampstands, which are the churches, and he's keeping an eye on each of us. This is Jesus' favorite title of himself, Son of Man. Notice what he has here. He's got a golden crown on his head, Greek word stephanos, meaning the crown of victory. He's got a sharp sickle in his hand, used for cutting grain, so you take it going back and forth. You sharpen it to cut it quickly. I have to stop there and think about a character that you probably know from Scripture, not Scripture, from literature. You probably saw him on uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and that is the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper. By the way, it's not a biblical concept, but what you see is it's a pagan concept. From the 15th century onward in Europe and other places, it was, it was a skeleton character. And he's got a black hood and a cloak. And in his hand, he's carrying a scythe, which is a long, tall sickle. Uh, I don't know exactly where they got that from. Maybe this text, but it's wrong. Uh, many a believer has gotten scared about death. We don't need to be scared about death. Death is the portal onto heaven. The concept of dying, I don't look forward to. But in some sense, aren't we all dying every moment of the day? But death, no. We know that we will be greeted into the loving hands of Jesus Christ, right? 
Verse 15 and 16. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right. Uh, If these are believers... Like I said, it's a picture of Jesus harvesting the grain and safely securing us in the barn. Or, this could be the first of two snapshots of reaping the earth of the wicked. We'll see the second one in verse 17 and 18. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. Now, it says here a sharp sickle. This is a different type of sickle. You would not use the same large sickle on grapes, right? Uh, You would have a totally messed up grape harvest. Instead, you use this sort of handheld sickle. It's very small. It's kind of the, the size of what a pruning knife would look like. And you would go to each of the vines and you would cut off the grapes. Um... Note this, though, there's an angel with a sharp sickle, and there's also an angel who has the power over fire. Notice where he's coming out of. Do you see it? He comes from the altar. Why is that important? Revelation 6 is why it's important. In Revelation 6, we'll see uh, these people that have been killed for the sake of Christ. They're martyrs, and they cry out saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And what does the Lord do? He gives them a white robe and he tells them to wait. What are they waiting for? They're waiting because more are going to be martyred upon the earth, whom God has given the gift of martyrdom to. That's the way they will die. As Jesus says in the book of John where he tells Peter, this is how you're going to glorify me through, through crucifixion. So, the reason why I mention this is because now God is going to pull out the card. Now he's going to say, okay, let's do vengeance. You, the angel from the altar, you've been, you've been hearing the prayers of the saints. The Lord has been hearing the prayers of the saints. I want you to go and take fire with you. And fire is a picture of judgment. And God is now going to avenge the martyrs for their deaths here. He says, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. These are definitely unbelievers, as we'll see in verse 19 and 20. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles, or as some of your translations might say, 600, rather 1,600 stadia which is approximately 200 miles. You see the word winepress here. If you've read the book of Isaiah or Joel as of late, you'll see it in there as well. It's a picture of God's wrath. In ancient days, uh, close to any vineyard, there would be a wine press, And it looked like a, a big old bathtub. Uh, and you'd bring in workers to trample the grapes, and they'd do it for hours upon hours. Uh, Connected to this big bathtub, you'd have a small drain pipe that led to a smaller bathtub where the grape juice would be collected in order to prepare it for distillation. By the time the workers were done crushing the grapes all day, y'all, it looked like a crime scene because they would have this, the blood, that literally what they call the blood of the grapes would be all over them, spattering up upon them. You'd have to shower. I mean, it would just be a holy mess. Notice this, though. It says, the wine press was trodden outside the city. This is a picture of God's wrath at the time of the tribulation. Uh, Question, though. If this is, in fact, referring to a specific city, what city would you guess this is? It doesn't tell you in the text. Um, I think, though, it is referring to a literal city. I think it's referring to Jerusalem in preparation for the armies of Armageddon. We see a small snippet of this in Isaiah 63 where you see the Lord and it says he's coming up from Edom and he's got got stuff all over his robe. What is that stuff? Well, I'll show you. 
Isaiah 63, it says, Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? And the Lord says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger, I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. Let me ask you this. Are you comfortable with this view of the Lord? He's walking around and he's crushing his enemies under his feet in the wrath of God. And the person looks, well, you're covered in blood. Exactly. This is what happens to unbelievers who never come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, the question is, is this, is, you know, 200 miles overflowing? Is this hyperbole for this use of effect of a great slaughter? Or is it literal language? It's hard to tell. If it is literal language, uh, the question is, is, does that blood spatter up or does it flow? Uh, horses' bridles are four and a half feet high for 200 miles. That's roughly the length of Israel. Uh, I don't know, but it may be an area outside of Jerusalem called the Plain of Estrelon. You've probably never heard of that, but I bet you've heard of the mountain that the Plain of Estrelon is right next to. It's called the Har of Megiddo, and we translate it as Har Megiddon. So I think that's probably what it is referring to. In conclusion, as we talk about these two topics, the doom of those who follow the Antichrist and those who reject Christ, but also, number two, the harvesting of the world. I'm really speaking to two groups of people today. And once again, please hear me again. This is not done from a sense of glee, not trying to scare people to come to Christ. No, no. But we have to teach what the Bible says, and we won't apologize for that. For believers and for unbelievers. Let me talk to the believers in the room for just a moment. Um, believer, your debt has been paid. You are righteous before the throne of God due to the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. <laughs> you, you, are, you are free. You're clean in, the, in God's sight. You are righteous in the sight of the creator of the universe. You will never experience any of this ever for eternity. Wow. So how do you then live, right, if your eternity is so secure? I would say number one, three things. Number one, praise the Lord for His incredible grace. Just to speak frankly with you all, I'm way too quick to bring to the Lord all my quote-unquote needs. Most of them are just desires. And I just want, I want. I, you know, give me, give me is basically what it sounds a whole lot like. But the fact is, is that we should begin our prayers with praise the Lord for His incredible grace. God the Father elected you before time began. God the Son paid the bridal price on the cross. God the Spirit drew you in repentance and faith. All glory to Him. The whole Trinity was working together to save each one of His elect. How amazing is that? So praise Him. Number two, I would encourage you to labor in the place where God has assigned you. Labor in the place God has assigned you. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about that. If you're single, don't seek to get married. If you're married, don't try to be single. Uh, there's nothing wrong, obviously, with seeking out a wife. But the point of it is, he's getting to, is that if you're a slave, if you can get freedom, great. But if not, you're a slave. If you're free, don't become a slave. The point is, is God has you at a particular time and place, at your job, in your neighborhood, right, to labor for the kingdom. Remember, the Spirit one day will, will give us a rest from our labors, but the idea is that we'll be laboring, right? Uh, how do you labor? Well, the fun things about it is we can follow the great commandment, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving your neighbors yourself. That can keep you busy for several lifetimes. Ephesians 2.10 makes it very clear that we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance that so we should walk in them, right? So labor wherever God has you today for the kingdom. You get, you're already on the team. You don't have to make the team. You're already on the team. You already have the praise. Of, God has accepted you fully. You don't have to win him over. It's just a way of saying thanks for saving me. And finally, the third thing is witness. Witness to the lost. John 4 makes it clear. It says, the, Jesus says, the fields are white for harvest. Lift up your eyes. 
If you're like me, you don't tend to lift up your eyes enough. But they're there. Your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, God put you there to witness to them. We're called to be his witnesses. I love the way Spurgeon has to say about it. He says, he says, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let none go unwarned and unprayed for. You can't win them to Christ. This is Spirit's work. But you can witness. And that's our role. If you're an unbeliever today, you might be saying, I've always heard God is love, and this passage doesn't sound like it. Let me close with two verses, and we'll close in prayer. Let me give you two things. Ezekiel 33, 11, Jesus, uh, rather, the Lord says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from his way and live. Right? God doesn't have this crazy desire dream to put people in hell. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. And yet at the same time, Edwards can say, Jonathan Edwards, there's nothing that keeps wicked men in any moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. All right. Ezekiel 33, 11. He didn't pleasure this. Number two is this. 1 John 4, 10. If you're wondering where's the love of God, it says, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, God's gift of love was his own son sent to die to cover the wrath of God so you don't have to go to hell today. Trust him, I implore you. Come to Jesus Christ today. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the day. Thank you for your grace in our lives that you, from the beginning of the world, you uh, chose to send your son to die for us. All praise to the son. I pray also for anybody that has not yet know your son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior and Lord. Grant them salvation today, we pray. In your son's name we pray, amen.